All right, it's uh, 8.30, so let's go ahead and get started. All right, good morning, everybody. How's everyone doing? I, f I always feel guilty asking that before the, the midterm, because I know, you know everyone's working really hard studying. And I know there's a homework due today, too. So um, so I know everyone's tired, but you know, thank you, everyone, for waking up early today, as, as always. Um, OK, so the plan for today, um, nor uh, like I said before, kind of normally, you know, I, I reserve this class session for, for a review session before the midterm. Uh, but because we're running a little bit behind schedule, we're going to keep going on with the lecture notes. But I think the good thing about that is today, I think, you know, by the end of today, we'll be all caught up. Um, and then you guys also have the review session or pre-recorded review sessions I posted on uh, on YouTube. Um, so anyone, so has anyone been able to check that out? Has that has that been uh, useful for you guys? Yeah, it helped. It's good. Okay, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what I'm hoping is that you know we can stay on schedule, and then by the next midterm we can have an, an in-class review session, um, just so that you guys can interact and ask questions and, and stuff like that. Um, and I, I think I think we'll be able to do that. Just the first half, I think you know it's still kind of figuring things out. So I was running a little bit behind. So you know, but hopefully after today we'll be we'll be caught. All right, are there any questions on the homework or, or anything about the midterm that I can answer before we uh, get started today? Uh, yeah, the midterm, is that going to be like a 24 hour type of exam or? Right, yeah, so um, so on Wednesday at 8.30, um, I'll open up the Zoom call, but there's there's going to be no lecture. Um, and basically the, the exam I wrote and it's, it's on uh, Canvas already, I, I just haven't published it. Um, and what you have is, is going to have 24 hours from Wednesday, 8.30 until Thursday, 8.30 uh, to finish the exam. Um, and so um, I don't know if you guys have taken Canvas exams before, but some of them will like actually time you to say you can only have the exam open for this amount of time. Um, I'm not going to do that. So, you know, uh, you can you can leave the exam open as much as you want, you know, just so you can look at the problems and have them. Um, it's just you have you have to submit it by 8.30 on Thursday in order for it to, uh, to count. And so it's, it's 24 hours, you know, real, real clock time. Um, not 24 hours in, in Canvas. Um, but, you know, definitely take advantage of all the time. Um, I wrote it as if it was like a 75 minute exam. So the, the length is, is still the same. And so when I take the exam today, I'm, I'm hoping to finish it within 20 minutes. That's usually my goal. And so, you know, I would, I would block off at least 75 minutes over that 24 hour period, but, you know, definitely take advantage of all the time that you need. Um, and so the only thing that I ask for the 24 hour exam is that, um, you know, you can, you can use, you know, all your notes, all the lecture videos, you know, um, all those things that you want. Uh, the only thing that I ask is that you don't, you know, you don't discuss the exam with, with anyone else uh, in the class uh, until until everyone has turned in the exam. So after after 8.30 on Thursday, you know, feel free to talk about the exam with uh, with your peers. But until then, I would ask that you guys just, uh, you know, just don't talk. But you can use basically any other resource that I've posted on the Canvas site um, to help you out. Okay. Uh, so the question is, how many problems? So the problem, there's going to be, um, I guess, you know, I. Usually what I, I do on my written exams is that there's four problems, but uh, the first problem is like a four-parter, but it's a short answer. And so when I did it on uh, Canvas, I it ended up being um, eight problems. Um, but the first, so the first four problems are going to be like short answer, um, you know, the, uh, or seven, seven problems, sorry. So the first four questions are going to be short answers. So you're just going to type into the, uh, into the browser, just a, a few sentences to, um, to answer the question. So very similar to how you did on the homework. And then the last three problems are going to be problem solving. So I'm going to give you, you know, a diagram. I'm going to ask you to solve for something. It's going to involve something with hydrostatics or, or Bernoulli equation. Um, and that's, and that's going to be the exam. Yeah. Each of the problem solving questions have three parts um, to them as well. Um, but they're, you know, they, I, I split up the parts so that they kind of help you kind of along with the problem. So it's uh, not three separate problems, but they're all kind of related to each other. So Uh, any more questions about the exam or the homework or, or anything? Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so last uh, uh, last Wednesday we started our lecture notes on fluid kinematics, and so fluid kinematics. Remember, this is the uh, um, you know, it doesn't it's it's not it's not a chapter that can kind of stand by itself where you can kind of refer to this as you know something for fluid mechanics. This is kind of more laying the groundwork for you know the next few weeks on uh, you know, how we're going to study fluid dynamics. Because you know, so far, you know, what we've covered is the Bernoulli equation, which you know, by itself is, is a really great equation, uh, just because it's relatively simple and it's very pretty easy to understand. But it's, you know, 
well, we already know that it's, it's extremely limited in, in how you can actually apply it to real situations. So in order to talk about some of the lot more um, complex equations, like, like uh, a control volume analysis or Navier-Stokes equations, or you know, as we get later on into like dr la drag and lift, um, you know, we need to uh, kind of know more of the, the language of fluid mechanics in order to get there. And that's what this chapter is all about. And so today we're going to go over, um, you know, I think we, we covered it, I think, in the last 10 minutes last time. But one of the really big central theorems for fluid kinematics that's really going to form the basis for what we're going to do over the next uh, two weeks, which is Reynolds transport theorem. And then you'll see me abbreviate it as RTT, um, just because Reynolds transport theorem kind of gets me to be a lot. Okay? And remember, the idea with Reynolds transport is that um, you know it's it's going to give us a framework on which to apply you know all of our classical conservation laws from physics, and so things like conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, um, conservation of energy, conservation of angular momentum. You know, all of these things we're going to go over. Uh, but traditionally, you know, when these things are when these laws are defined. And physics, they're defined from a uh, Lagrangian point of view. So for a fixed amount of mass, you know, we can define very easily from physics, you know, what the conservation of mass is going to be, what the conservation of momentum is going to be. Um, but as we know for fluids, you know, this is not a very convenient way to describe fluids. And so we need a framework to kind of connect these two ideas of like a Lagrangian viewpoint and an Eulerian viewpoint. Okay? And so that's kind of the point of Reynolds transport. And so I think the, uh, where we left off last time was this, um, this kind of, uh, um, I guess, uh, this comparison between an extensive property and then the, the corresponding intensive property. Okay? And so we called, we defined big B and little b, okay? where this big B right here, this is some extensive property. Okay? And remember our definition for extensive property is some kind of property of a, uh, of a fluid um, or any substance, I guess, that depends on the mass um, or the amount of substance that are there, okay? And so things like um, mass, right? So mass depends on mass, right? Um, momentum, right? So the amount of momentum that an object has is mass times velocity. So, you know, obviously this depends on mass. Um, things like kinetic energy, you know, kinetic energy to, to, uh, is a one half mv squared. So that depends on mass. And so extensive properties, you know, um, these are going to depend on the amount of substance or the amount of mass that you have. Okay. Okay. And this little m right here, this is mass. Okay. And little b right here, this is the corresponding intensive property. So it's like kind of, you can kind of think of it as an intensive form of the extensive property we have on the other side. And remember, intensive properties are of, a, of a substance are the same no matter how much of the substance that you have. So things like density, things like pressure, right? So it doesn't matter how much um, water that you have in, a, in, a, in, a, you know, in an ocean, right? All the water, well, I mean, all the water that you have, let's say, in your swimming pool has the same density. Um, I almost said uh, the, uh, the ocean, but the ocean, there's, there's lots of stratification of, uh, of different temperatures and salt content. So it's not quite all the same density, but, you know, you, you, you take, you know, a a cup full of water in your swimming pool, either take it from the top, take it from the bottom, or you take a bucket amount of it, um, you know, it's those, that water is always going to have the same density, and that's what an intensive effort is. Okay. And so what we need is, so the idea with Reynolds transport is that we're going to have a mathematical framework that connects these two ideas, because typically for a conservation law, a conservation law acts on this guy, right? And so we can say we can have conservation of mass, we have conservation of momentum, right? All these are extensive properties. There's no such thing as like conservation of density, conservation of, uh, of pressure, because um, those things don't exist. And so in order for us to apply our conservation laws, we need a way to kind of connect these two guys uh, within a mathematical thing. Okay? 
Uh, okay, are there uh, any questions on this? Okay. All right, so, um, you know, this, this, this whole idea with Reynolds transport and, um, you know, later on once we get to the general form, it's a very um, abstract mathematical thing. Um, and so, you know, I, I think with this kind of more, I mean, analogies are useful anywhere, but I think with this more than anything, I think an analogy is really useful. And so as we're going to go about this discussion, what I want you to think about is like a, like a bank account. Okay? okay. And so if you think about a bank account, the amount of money in the bank account can change in three ways. Right. And so first we have deposits, right? And so that one's pretty straightforward. So you take money that you have now and you deposit it into your bank account. And that's one way that the, the bank account can grow. Okay. And so another way, another way the balance in your bank account can change is withdrawals, right? And so you withdraw money, you take money away from your bank account, then there's, uh, there's less money in there, right? Okay, and there's actually a third way that, that money in your bank account can change. Uh, maybe not so much nowadays, but um, you know, usually if you deposit money into like a uh, maybe like a, maybe not a checking account, but like a savings account uh, or like a money market account or like a certificate of deposit, you know, you're gonna earn you're gonna earn interest on that bank account. Right. And so the idea with interest is that you know just by money having money into your bank. You know what the bank's actually what the bank is actually kind of doing behind the scenes is that they're kind of taking your money and investing it in uh, in other stuff, um, and so because of that, you know, because you're letting the bank use your money for those purposes, you know, the bank kind of pays you, uh, you know, a rate. So, you know, I mean, nowadays the interest rates are pretty small, but you know, you can think of it as like you know, you have a thousand dollars in there, and if the bank pays one percent, then every month or every year the bank's going to give you um, ten bucks just for using your money. So this is you can kind of think of it as almost like money that's being generated out of nothing. Because if you kind of just have just the perspective of just your bank account, you know the interest rate is money that you're that is uh, accumulating in your bank account or being generated without you having having to actually put money in there. So um, and so those are the three different ways that uh, um, that money can be or, or your bank account can change. Okay? And so let's write this in formula form. And so if we, uh, on one side of the equation, if we have the, the bank account balance, which is the amount of money you have in your bank account, and let's, uh, let's put all of these guys into formula form. So then we have interest, right? Interest has a positive sign because this is money that's, uh, that's being generated in your account. Next, we have deposits, right? And that's also a, a positive sign because it's uh, you know money that's being added to your account. And then we subtract uh, withdrawals. Okay? Okay. And so you know this is something that that's pretty you know. Um, you know, straightforward, but this is actually, you know, uh, the basis of, uh, of the Reynolds transport. So I want you guys to keep this analogy as we go throughout the class today, and I'll kind of keep referring back to it. Uh, but this idea of like a bank account and how things can, can change within that bank account, you know, this is something that's going to serve us pretty well with Reynolds transport. Uh, all right, any questions on, on this? Okay, so let's uh, let's let's come back to fluid mechanics. And so uh, I think at the end of last lecture, we also talked about things, the difference between a system and a control volume. And so let me actually draw uh, both of those right now. Okay. And so let's consider uh, flowing a pipe. Okay. And so you'll see me use this uh, this notation kind of throughout the next few weeks, but I'll draw an enclosed um, area like this 
um, with dotted lines as a control volume. And so remember from last uh, from last week that a control volume is nothing more than just a fixed region of space. So we're going to just kind of predefine. Uh, you can't think of it as like drawing cones around a certain area of space and keeping that. Okay. <clears throat> and so let's say that we have flow coming into this uh, control volume. And so on the left hand side, we'll have a velocity u1. And on the right hand side, we'll have a velocity u2. So we have flow coming in and coming out. And then what we're interested in in this control volume is how some extensive property is going to evolve. Remember, big B is our extensive property. Um, you know, we're interested. We're interested in seeing how that's going to evolve within this control volume. Okay. At least Boyle woke up late today. And so, you know, specifically when I say how B is going to evolve in our control volume, what I specifically mean is what is the rate of change of, of B, okay? And so if we go back to, you know, uh, you know, what we know from calculus, the way that we're going to express a rate of change is with a time derivative, right? And so let's express it like this. And so the, uh, if we take the time derivative of B within our control volume, so that's what we're expressing mathematically here. So we have partial uh, B uh, underscore CV, which stands for control volume, partial T. Okay? And, uh, this is the rate, and this is the rate of change of some extensive quantity B within the control volume. So another way, I think, to kind of say this in, in plain language is that you can kind of think of this as the accumulation of B within the control volume. Okay, and then next we're going to talk about, um, you know, the mechanisms or how an extensive property can actually um, change and act, how it can actually evolve within a control volume, and then we'll bring that back to our, our bank account. Okay. All right, any questions on, on this? Okay. Okay, so let's talk about the ways that um, some extensive property B can, can actually change in a control volume. Okay. okay. And so the first way that B can change, uh, especially when fluid, so remember, remember I, I want you guys to remember that this control volume, there's fluid flowing into it and flowing out of it. Okay? Um, and so one way that B can change into a, in a control volume is simply that, you know, it gets carried in from the inflow. Okay. okay. And so if you think of like, a, like, like a mug of coffee, right? And so, you know, a, a coffee mug might be empty at first, but one way that you can uh, put more coffee mass into your coffee mug is to actually pour coffee in, right? And so by pouring coffee in, you have like an inflow of coffee. And so that changes the amount of mass of coffee inside your coffee mug. Okay. And so that's one way that B can change, that what, there's one, that's one way that an extensive property can change is, is simply you just put, you put it in there through the flow. So it flows, it flows in from the fluid. And so another way that, uh, um, that B can change in a control volume is that it just flows out, right? Okay. And so coming back to our, our coffee mug analogy, say if you have a, a mug full of coffee and then like your, uh, um, your asshole, a little uh, sibling, comes and just pokes a hole into it, right? And coffee's gonna flow out of it through that leak, right? And so by um, having um, something that goes out of your control volume, by flowing out with the fluid, 
you can change the amount of some extensive property. So, you know, through, out through the leak, you know, there's going to be over time less coffee into your, in your coffee mug um, because of that outflow. Okay. okay. And so I think, you know, inflow, outflow, I think that's relatively, um, you know, um, easy to visualize because it's, you know, there's the mass perspective, I think is easy. But one other thing that, um, one other way that B can change, and this is not for mass, because we, we know that mass is, can't be created or destroyed. But if we go um, think about other things like, uh, like momentum or energy, right? Um, I, know, I know energy, you can't create or destroy it too. But from a, from a fluid mechanics perspective, you know, we have devices like pumps and we have devices like turbines, which can either input energy into a flow or extract it. Okay? And so the way that we kind of can kind of sum up a lot of those, um, those phenomenon is we can say that um, our extensive property B can either be generated or consumed uh, in our control. Okay. Okay. And so I think out of the three here, you know, generation and consumption is, is kind of harder to visualize, but like if you think of like a, like a water pump, right? Um, and so, you know, you can take still water and pump it up, you know, to a very high storey building. And the way that it does that is by inputting like either electrical or mechanical energy into the flow, okay? And so we'll, we'll cover this kind of a lot more in detail um, later on, but just kind of think of this as, you know, an extensive property within, just from a food, just from the food's perspective can be generated in some way. You're talking about the like generation or consumption of energy within the fluid. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's you can kind of think of it almost as like you know external things, uh, external things that uh, external effects that you can apply on the fluid to generate something. So I think the first the first case we'll come up on this is uh, conservation momentum, and so me momentum for a fluid you can generate it by applying a force onto it, right? Um, and so, you know, obviously that force came from somewhere, you know, that you're putting onto it, but from the fluids, from, but from the fluids perspective, you know, that force is, you know, being generated, its force is being used to generate momentum within the, within the fluid. Um, and so I, I think, you know, this one will definitely kind of make more sense as we get to conservation momentum, conservation energy, but just kind of, uh, just kind of bear with me that, you know, just think that some extensive property within the fluid, from, from the perspective of the fluid can be either spontaneously created or spontaneously destroyed within the, uh, uh, within the control volume. So, um, yeah. Um, right. Okay. Uh, and so those are the three ways that, that B can change in a control volume. And so let's actually bring this back to our bank account analysis. Okay? And so remember our bank account uh, equation was something like this. And so we had our bank balance was equal to um, interest. Okay. Plus deposits. Minus uh, withdrawals. Okay. And so if we uh, draw a connection with kind of the four things that we talked about for, for B, you know, your bank balance, this could be the same thing as like accumulation, right? And so accumulation, remember, that's what we, uh, that's what we talked about on the previous slide, right? And the, the fact that some extensive property B can either accumulate uh, or accumulate or, or deplete within your uh, control volume, okay? And so if we uh, say that interest is the same thing as generation and consumption, Deposits were the same thing as inflows. And then withdrawals are the same as outflows. Okay. And so all these same ideas apply for, you know, for Reynolds transport. And that's kind of the, uh, that's kind of the idea for Reynolds transport is that, you know, the reason it's called the Reynolds transport theory is because it, it describes how, you know, um, properties or how some, uh, um, so quantities are transported through a, a fluid. And then kind of the basis of that transport relationship is, is this, where we have accumulation of some property is equal to uh, whatever, however that property is generated or consumed within the control volume, plus uh, what the uh, fluid is carrying into the control volume, minus what the fluid is carrying out. 
Right. And then with this, you know, we, uh, we're ready to actually formally state the, uh, the definition for rental transport, which I'll do on the next slide. Okay. Uh, before I do that, are there uh, any questions on, on this? Okay, so let's state the, the formal definition of RTT. Okay, so the formal definition is this. So it says that the rate of change um, for some extensive property B Um, for a system um, is equal to the time rate of change of B within the control volume And the net and the next the net flux of that property um, through the control volume surface. Okay. So it's a lot of words, but it's uh you know it's a. Uh, it's, it's an important definition to know. And we'll, I'll put it in formula form um, down here, okay? Okay, and so in formula form, uh, you know, at least one form of rents transport, you can uh, express it like this, okay? And so we have D, uh, partial B, CV, partial T, okay? This is equal to um, uh, big derivative of B, okay, plus, Row one, A one, U one, B one, okay, minus row two, A two, U two, B two. Okay. And so this is kind of the mathematical form or the simplest mathematical form for Reynolds transport. Okay. And let me label all the terms here. And so remember this uh, this partial derivative right here. This is the accumulation of B within the control volume. Okay. And so that's accumulation. This uh, big derivative right here, this is uh, generation or consumption. Okay. This uh, term right here, this is inflow. And this right here is out. And so depending on what your property is, uh, you can basically express how it, how it evolved within a control volume with this, uh, with this expression, okay? And after this, I'll, I'll do an example of basically kind of illustrate this in use, because you know, I know this is a, you know, a kind of a, a, a big mathematical expression, and it's not really a formula to, uh, to memorize or anything. Um, you know, and that's kind of why you know, I, I spent a lot of time with the analogy, because I, I want this to kind of be an expression that you kind of, um, you know, just kind of, it's, it becomes part of your intuition on how things um, evolve within a uh, control, within a fluid, okay? And so, you know, um, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be applying this to basically a lot of different kinds of properties. Because right now this B, you know, I haven't defined it because it can be any extensive property. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to say that big B is equal to mass, big B is equal to momentum, big B is equal to energy. And then over the next the next couple of weeks, you know, we'll see this applied for all those different uh, all those different situations. Okay. All right, are there uh, any questions on on this before we jump into an example? So the inflow outflow that's the the density area speed and what was right? Yes, yeah. So B one B two. Yeah. So uh, so row one is uh, row is density, A is area. Uh, U is velocity, and B, little b is the intensive form of our extensive property. So, B 
big V and little B are related. And so big V is like the extensor property, like mass momentum. And then little B is like mass per mass or momentum per mass. So you just take your extensor property, and you divide it by, by mass. Yeah. Okay. All right, so let's do, an, uh, let's do an example. All right, so let's say that you have a fire extinguisher. Um, and then we're interested in, in talking in, in uh, expressing uh, how much mass or how much uh, or how the mass in the fire extinguisher is evolving. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to do my best. Let's use colors to uh, make this look a little bit nicer. All right. So there's our fire extinguisher. And so as you push the button on the fire extinguisher, you know, the, uh, the, the fire retardant or the uh, whatever uh, fluid is inside is gonna come out, okay? And so let's say that the fire retardant has a density of rho, so we know the density. Um, this air, this uh, nozzle right here has an area A, okay. and so we know the outlet area, okay? And then we know that when we push the button, the, uh, the fire retardant is going to come out with a uh, velocity, or velocity U, sorry. Okay, and so what we want to do is we want to uh, use our Reynolds transport theorem in order to express how the mass and the control volume is changing with respect to time. Okay, and so the first thing that you're that we're going to do, um, and this and this will become obnoxious over the next couple of weeks, um, is that the first thing you want to do in these kinds of problems is you need to draw your control volume. Okay? And so we need to define the space in which we want to do our analysis. Okay? And so for a lot of these, it's going to be very obvious what the control volume is going to be. Uh, but I don't want you to overlook the step because you know if you uh, when you go and, and do fluid mechanics analysis out in the real world um, and you want to apply control volume analysis, you know, a lot of times the step is not super obvious. So and we're going to talk later today on how to draw how to draw good control volumes. Okay. Um, and so for this one, it, it's it's fairly obvious because since we're interested in things within the fire extinguisher, it makes sense that we draw our control volume around that fire extinguisher. And so again, you know, I'm going to use these dotted lines to uh, to denote the control volume. Okay. And so that's our control volume there, which I've drawn in the green. Okay. And now that we've done that, now we can express uh, Reynolds transport. Okay. And so um, let me write out the uh, the formula again. So we have partial B C B partial T is equal to big uh, D, B in the system, um, DT, plus row one, um, U1, B1, A1, minus row two, U2, B2, A2, okay? Right, and so this is our uh, general, um, general expression for RTT. And so now that we uh, have our general expression, we need to put, uh, we need to express it in terms of the variable that we're interested in. 
And so in this case, we're interested in mass. Okay? And so since our uh, property that we're interested in mass, we can go ahead and set that within our control window. Okay? Okay. And so in order to do that, uh, let's, let's go ahead and apply that. So if mass is our property, that means our big B is going to be just mass. And since big and since little b is nothing more than just uh, big B divided by m, okay. In this particular case, we have m divided by m, which is just one. Okay. And so we can uh, plug this into our. Uh, uh, we can plug these b's into our our dt, and we can continue on with this analysis. All right. Any uh, any questions on the uh, on the problem setup? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Shoot. So the question is, uh, where did the one come from? So remember, uh, our, remember our relationship from between big B and little B from the very beginning of our notes, right? And so the relationship between big B and little b is that big B is just equal to m times little b. And so for this particular problem, you know, our, the property or the extensive property that we're interested in is mass. And so for that, pro and for that problem, we set um, big B is equal to m, right? And so depending on the type of problem that you're going to do, you're going to define big B to be whatever is, is interesting in that problem. And so a big B is basically, you kind of think of it as something that you're free to define. And so in this case, we said big B is equal to mass because we're interested in how much mass is in the control volume. And so if we plug in M in for big B right here, then we can little see that little B is equal to big B over M, which is M over M, which is one, right? Yep. Okay, um, and so let's go ahead and do that. And so if we plug in uh, little m in for mass, then we have partial mass within the control volume. Okay. Partial t is equal to um, dm dt plus rho 1 u1 a1 minus rho 2 u2 a2. Okay. Okay. And so let's, uh, let's examine each of these terms and kind of remind ourselves what they are, right? And so remember this first partial derivative right here, this is the accumulation of, a, of mass in, in the control volume. Okay. And so in this case, it's the accumulation of mass within our fire extinguisher, okay? Well, I guess in this case, it, it'll be the, the, um, the depletion of mass. And so we'll leave that term alone because we know that when we push the fire extinguisher, you know, less fire retardant is going to be within the fire extinguisher. Over time, you know, there's going to be a decrease in the amount of meat. So we'll leave that term alone. Okay. Next, we have this term. Okay. And so remember, this is the generation or consumption, or you can actually think of it as the generation or the destruction of uh, um, uh, in within uh, within the system. Okay. And so the and so the uh, the key the key um, word right here that I forgot to write is in is uh, system. Okay? And so this second derivative term right here, this is how you can kind of think of it as how the how the uh, property is changing within a, a system. So remember, a system is a fixed amount of mass, right? Um, and so for something that has a fixed amount of mass, you know, there's no way for mass to be um, generated or destroyed within there, right? Because of conservation mass. And so we can say that this term right here is going to be zero um, because you know mass cannot be generated or destroyed within a fixed amount of mass. A little bit of a tongue twister, but that's kind of how it is. All right. So next we have um, inflow. And so, by looking at our, uh, our our problem here, you know, do we have um, do we have any inflow of fire retardant into the fire extinguisher? 
Um, and so in this case, since, since we're not refilling the fire extinguisher, we can say that the inflow is zero. So we're going to cross that out. And so the last term there is outflow, which is something that we are going to have here because when we push the button, you know, fire retardants going to come out, it's going to expel out of the fire extinguisher, and so we're going to have outflow. Okay? And so our final expression for this uh, problem using RTT is we can say that the, uh, the amount of mass of fire retardant within the control volume is going to be equal to minus rho u a. Okay? Okay? I dropped the subscript too because we don't have an inflow, so I'm just saying that it's going to be the, the product of the density times the velocity times the area. All right. So this is kind of just a simple example just to kind of, again, you know, it's, it's not a, uh, you know, of course you can plug in numbers into this thing, but you know, what I really want you to get from this uh, lecture today is just kind of this intuitive, um, you know, understanding this intuitive feel for Reynolds transport and what each of the terms in the Reynolds transport uh, represent. All right, any, uh, any questions on this? Yeah, so the question is, do those variables have subscripts? So in, in, this, in, the, in the general form, or which I have, or in the, uh, in the RTT that I have up here, you know, I use subscripts one and two to denote, or to differentiate between the inflow and the outflow. Uh, but in this case, since we don't have any inflow, I just drop the subscripts and just say that, you know, we have the product of density times velocity times the area. Yeah. Mm um i got a question i'm curious sure. for uh, the rtt at the top there we have our masses cancel each other out in this case because we're utilizing the same mass within the fire extinguisher it's not going to be like the mass of the extinguisher and the fluid inside of it and so yeah at, that's actually a good ex a distinction so when i say mass in this case and, and kind of when i say mass at, at any other point you know what i'm saying is the mass of the fluid within the fire extinguisher um and so there there wasn't really anything that canceled um, you know, there weren't different terms here that canceled out, but what I said was this first term, you know, is going to be zero because, um, because, uh, you know, this first term right here represents how mass can either be created or destroyed within that system. And so it's because we have conservation of mass that, you know, mass can never be created or destroyed, you know, we have this term equal to zero. And so, so this is basically conservation of mass. Okay. Based on conservation of mass, but it's, is that usually zero then? So for, for mass, this term, so when we apply this uh, RTT to mass, this term will always be zero because there's, okay. uh, there's no way for mass to be generated or destroyed. But, and so that term's only going to come in once we do things like momentum and energy and more momentum. Uh, but every time we do apply this for mass, it is going to be zero. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And for the uh, other remaining masses for the inflow and outflow, um, I noticed that you omitted those. Um, um, so the, uh, so remember for the inflow and outflow, those are little b. And so little b, remember, is one in this case because little uh, b is yeah, mass course. divided by mass. Yeah, yeah, because we set up the notion that, uh, that uh, big b is equal to m. So exactly. Uh, right. yeah, I forgot about that. All right, cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So there's one more question in the chat. So the question is just to be sure our system in this example is the fire extinguisher. So actually, yeah, that's, that's a good distinction here. And so in this case, the fire extinguisher was our control volume. Okay. And so the system in this case, remember, a system represents a fixed amount of, uh, of fluid. And so in this case, you can you can kind of think of as the of the system as like the uh, um, the fluid within the control volume that we're going to follow as we expel it. Okay? And so at the beginning, you know, our system and our control volume they're they're almost the same because we're encapsulating all the fluid within the control volume. But after we we turn the fire extinguisher on, you know, that fluid is going to exit out the out, out of the fire extinguisher. And so after we turn it on, the system is going to follow all the fluid that exits the control volume because it has to follow that fixed amount of, of, of fluid, fixed amount of mass. But our control volume is going to be the same. So after we turn the fire extinguisher on, you know, um, the fluid is going to go out. So the system is going to follow it, but our control volume is going to be in the same place. Okay. Okay. 
yeah, that's a, that's, that's a good distinction to, uh, to make. Okay. Um, and so that's just a kind of a, a first uh, look or a first taste of RTT. Okay. Uh, but believe it or not, that's not the most general form for RTT. So there's a, a more general form um, that mathematically looks um, 10 times more intimidating. Um, because the, the the example that we just did just now was just a uh, uh, was just a one D case, uh, but because fluids is a three dimensional phenomenon, you know we need a more general form for this. Okay. Right. And so this is the general form. It involves a lot of integrals. Okay. Okay. But the, all the principles are still the same. And so I know that this uh, expression is going to look a little bit scary, but you know I want you to keep in mind our bank account analogy and, and all the meanings of the different terms because that's I'm going to define them, um, you know, for you here. Okay. And so this is the general form for a Reynolds transport. Don't worry, you know, even once we go on the next few weeks, we're actually not going to be evaluating these, uh, these integrals. So these are, um, well, this is a volume integral. So that's basically a, a 3D integral or a triple integral. Um, you know, you guys can do that. But this is a, a surface integral. So depending on if you've taken 308 already or and who you have for 308, you know, surface integrals, you know, even if you had 308, you know, surface integrals are a little bit uh, difficult to work. With. So even though the, uh, the mathematical form changed, you know, all the terms here are, you know, they, they're, we have all the same players. They just kind of have different, uh, different outfit. You kind of think about. Okay. And so just like we saw in the 1D case, we have our accumulation terms. That's on the left-hand side. We have our generation consumption term. And then this surface integral right here, this is the combination of both the inflow and the outflow. Um, and so uh, another way that we can say this, or let me write that first. So this is inflow, outflow, right? And so the more common term that you'll see for this in the book is that this is the flux term. Right here, right? And so the uh, kind of the general term for flow into a control on and out is, uh, is flux, okay? Right. And so we have basically all the same players here. It's just, uh, you know, they're just in different mathematical forms. And this form will be, you know, you can use this for three or for 2D and 3D cases um, in, the, uh, um, in the problem, okay? Oh, so the question is, uh, what does it say in parentheses? So in parentheses right here, let me rewrite it. And so parentheses, this is, the, this is a, a dot product. And so we have U um, vector. And so this U with the, with the arrow over here, this is velocity vector. And then we're going to take a dot product between the velocity vector with uh, with n hat, and so n hat right here. This is a normal vector. And so actually later on, you know, I'll I'll show you what actually this is in the next uh, in two more steps. I'll show you what the normal vector is and why that one's. In. Okay, so that's the general form. Um, but sometimes, um, you know, depending on the problem that we're doing, a lot of times we like to have um, the generation term on one side of the equal sign by itself. And so all I'm gonna do is just, I'm gonna add the, uh, the flux term to the other side, and I'll show you kind of a, a, a different form of this. It's not really a different form, it's just, you know, it just we move things around algebraically. And so we can say that, uh, uh, db cis dt okay, is equal to partial partial t of the integral of rho b db in our control volume okay, plus our flux term. Okay. And so sometimes you'll see RTT in this form too. 
Um, but you know, it's, it's just moving things around um, much greater. Okay. Okay. And so, you know, for the rest of today, what I what I really what I really want to talk about is uh, um, is this guy right here. Because this is the term that we're going to um, evaluate kind of the most often in our control volume analysis. Okay. And what you'll see is that this is kind of a, an integral kind of general expression of our inflow outflow, which is remember density times little b times velocity times area. So this is just kind of the general formula. Okay. All right. Any questions on, on this? Okay. All right, and so uh, what I really want to draw your guys' attention to is the, the actual, the, actually the term in the parentheses. Okay? And so we have u dot product with n, okay? Because <clears throat> this is going to be probably the most important part for our calculations, okay? Uh, and so just like it was mentioned earlier, this is a dot product. A dot product of velocity and a unit normal vector. Okay. Right. And so the important thing with this dot product um, is, is, I mean, the value obviously is something important when we evaluate this. But the, the thing that I, I want you guys to pay attention to is the sign of this dot product. And because the sign of this dot product is, is going to determine whether, you know, uh, whether we have an inflow or an outflow. Okay, because you'll notice, you know, in our general form of RTT, you know, our inflow and outflow aren't separate terms. I kind of club them together into just one integral, right? And the reason we can do that is because this, uh, this dot product here, um, whatever sign this is, it's going to determine whether that's an inflow or an outflow. Okay. okay. And so let's uh, uh, so let's kind of talk about the two cases. Okay. And so let's uh, let's take a case. Let's say that this is our control volume right here. Okay. And let's say that we have a velocity coming in this way. Okay. And so our normal vector right here is facing out. Okay. Because remember the uh, the normal vector is always going to face outward from our surface. And so if we evaluate our, our dot product here, and so if we evaluate u, u dot product with n, okay? Even, you know, before we plug in values here, what we'll notice is that u and n are facing in opposite directions, right? And so because they're facing in opposite directions, what we can say is that the dot product between u and n is gonna be less than zero, okay? And if u dot n is less than zero, then um, you know this uh, this quantity is going to be an inflow. Okay. So in cases where the velocity and the normal vector are facing opposite directions, then we have a negative dot product. Then we know that that quantity is going to be an in inflow. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Any questions on on this? And so let's uh, let's do the analogous case for an outflow. Okay. And so let's say that we have a control volume. Here's our velocity going this way. Okay. And if we draw the normal vector, the normal vector is going to be like this. Okay. And so in this case, <clears throat> because the velocity and the normal vector are facing in the same direction, this dot product between them is gonna be greater than zero. So we're gonna have a positive number. And so in cases where the velocity and the normal vector are facing in the same direction, um, our dot product should be positive and we know that we have an outflow. Okay. 
Okay. <clears throat> All right. And so, you know, that's basically what that control, what that, uh, that dot product shows. All right. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, um, I, I don't want to say any too much more about, you know, evaluating the terms of RTT, because that's going to come, you know, in the next couple of weeks when we actually apply it to, uh, uh, to situations. Okay. Uh, but I do want to talk about just a, a, couple, a few more topics, um, just, you know, to kind of draw some connections to what we did last week, uh, but also kind of set us up for the future. Okay. And so the first thing I want to talk about is, uh, you know, let's compare uh, RTT with um, another mathematical construct that we did last week, and that was the material derivative. And so if you remember, the material derivative um, was uh, a way that we could express um, also the rate of change within a fluid, um, but just within a different co uh, context. Okay? And so let me try out both of these. So let me start with RTT. Okay, so we have uh, dB dt is equal to partial partial t um, integral of rho b dv plus our flux term. Okay, so this is on the control volume, this is on the control surface. And so we have rho b u dot n dA. Okay. And then let's compare this to our material derivative. So we have d b dt plus um, or equal, sorry, equal partial b partial t plus u partial b partial x plus b partial b partial y plus w partial b partial z. Okay, so that's the fully three-dimensional form. Okay. All right. And so when you kind of draw them side by side like this, you, you start to see some of the, the parallels between them. Okay. First, you see that these guys, you know, they look the same, um, and that's kind of on purpose, right? Um, and so you can kind of think of the, uh, um, the terms that I've circled in, in magenta right there. Those are kind of the total rate of change of the property uh, within a uh, within, you know, uh, just kind of by itself. Okay. Right, next we have the terms that I've circled in blue. So uh, remember uh, from our material derivative, you know, the one on the bottom, that was the unsteady term and the fact that, you know, our property can change as a function of time without even moving. And then this is analogous to, um, you know, the accumulation term within RTT, okay? And then finally, we have these guys, okay? And so remember, these guys, um, you know, they represent um, changes that occur um, with the flow, okay? And so these are changes that, you know, the, the fact that flow can carry properties, you know, with it, you know, as it flows throughout, okay? And so even though these two guys are, uh, you know, they're, they're different, you know, they, they express a lot of the same ideas on how things can change within fluid, okay? And so kind of the big difference between them is that RTT, okay? RTT is applied to fixed regions of space, so this is for control volumes. Okay, versus a material derivative Uh, this is for um, fluid particles. <clears throat> and we can define kind of these terms kind of more, uh, more specifically. In the magenta here, we have total rate of change. So in the blue right here, this is kind of an unsteady accumulation. Okay. And in the purple right here, we have um, <clears throat> a convection or transport within the flow.
so let me draw let me write this term more clearly and so in the blue right here we have unsteady accumulation And so that's that's how you can kind of draw the analogies between those those guys. <clears throat> okay. Um, and so you know, even though we you know um, covered different things um, last week and this week, you know, there you can draw the connection between them because they're all kind of under the same umbrella of fluid kinematics, uh, which is you know we're interested in howling and expressing how things change within a fluid. Okay. Okay. Um, oh, so, okay. So the question is, can I go one back? Yep, I can do that. All right, any questions on uh, this comparison here? Okay. Okay, and so the last thing that uh, I want to cover today is, uh, you know, how do we draw a good control volume? Okay. And I'll put good in parentheses here because it's, uh, you know, it's not an objective thing. Um, although it's easy to say what, you know, what are some better control volumes than other ones, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, there's no formula, there's no recipe for it. And so what I'm going to, the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to give you some, uh, some things to look out for and some, uh, some rules of thumb. Uh, but, you know, ultimately, you know, it's, it's a little bit of an art to do. Okay. okay. All right. Um, and so the first thing that I'll say is that when we do control volume analysis, usually we're interested in things like, <clears throat> you know, what is the velocity or what is the pressure? What is the force, right? And in particular, we're interested in solving for these things at a specific location within our system, within a uh, uh, within our problem. Okay. Okay. And so the thing, the thing with control volume analysis and RTT is that it very naturally, uh, you know, it's, it's very easy to compute things on the boundary of our control volume, but it's very difficult to compute things on the interior, okay? And so if we, if we know that we want to, uh, you know, compute something at a certain location, you know, the best way to draw your control volume is to make sure that your boundary coincides with this location. And so let's say that we have flow in a channel like this. And let's say that we're interested in, uh, you know, say that we want the, uh, the pressure at this location here. Okay? And so the way that we, uh, we can draw our control volume that's going to be good is that if we draw, the, we draw it so that the edge of the control volume matches up with this location. And so what you don't want to do, let me draw a uh, uh, similar situation. And so what you don't want to do is say that, you know, if we want the velocity or the pressure here, we don't want to completely encapsulate it. Okay. And so this is good. This is bad. And so wherever you want to compute things like pressures or forces or anything, try to make sure that your control volume boundary matches up with that location. Okay. Okay. There's a cartoon I, I watched growing up called Animaniacs, and they had a, they had a little uh, sketch called Good Idea, Bad Idea. So I think this is kind of my version of that. So you know, on the left, good idea. On the right, bad idea. 
All right, any questions on, on this? Okay. Okay, and so the other rule of thumb that I'm gonna give you, uh, it actually pertains to that dot product term that we talked about before. And so when you're evaluating this term or when you're computing it, it's actually most convenient, you know, if these, if these two vectors um, are perfectly in line, okay? Because if you uh, kind of remember from before, you know, one way that we can compute this dot product is we can say that um, u dot n is equal to the magnitude of u times the magnitude of n times the cosine of the angle between them, right? And so, you know, when you're computing these things, the most convenient thing is if the angle is zero or 180. And so the way that you do that is uh, you draw your control volume such that the, uh, the boundary of the control volume is perpendicular to the velocity. And so let's do another episode of good idea, bad idea. Okay. And so let's say that we have flow like this and we have a velocity going just perfectly horizontally like this. Okay. And so a good idea is we can uh, draw our control volume surface such that it's like this. Okay. And so in this particular case, you can see that our velocity U and our control volume surface you know, there's a 90 degree angle right there. So when there's a 90 degree angle, when we draw our normal vector, you know, these two guys are gonna be perfectly in line. And so this is good idea. Right? And so the corresponding bad idea might look like this. So let's say that we have velocity coming in and it's horizontal, okay? And so a bad idea would be to like draw something like this. Okay? So if you draw like a slanted surface, like even worse, you can draw, you know, a curved surface like, like this. And so when you draw surfaces like this, it becomes really inconvenient to compute that dot product term. And so this is a bad idea. Okay. Right, so two general rules of thumb. So, um, you know, right now they're a little bit abstract because, you know, we haven't done that many examples. Um, but, you know, as we do more examples over the next couple of weeks, you know, I want you guys to keep this in mind and think about, you know, what are some good ways to draw these control volumes, okay? All right, any questions on, on this? <clears throat> okay. Okay. And so the last, uh, the last thing I, I want to cover today um, is just, it's, it's more, just, more just to put the idea in your guys' head and just to say that this is a possibility, is the, uh, is the idea of a control volume that actually moves or deforms. Okay. Okay. And so for, um, for most of the problems, I'd say maybe like, maybe 85 to 90% of them, you know, our control volume is gonna be literally fixed in space. So it's, it's not going to move uh, because our, our object itself is not going to move. Uh, but sometimes, you know, we are gonna cover situations where our object or our, you know, our, you know, our, our, our flow of interest is on something that's going to move, okay? Um, and, you know, when, when we do an example of this, you would, you're gonna say, you know, why would we ever do this? Um, but in some cases, it's actually more convenient. Okay. okay. 
And so kind of the simplest example that we'll, we'll, we'll do this in kind of more depth uh, next week is say that you have a, uh, a, in the book they call this a cart, but it's like, there's no cart in the world that looks like this, but it's kind of the, uh, it's kind of a convenient way to express the flow. And so let's say that we have like a, like a ramp here. Okay. And this ramp is on wheels. And then let's say that we have, uh, we're spraying a fluid at the ramp like this. Okay. All right, and so if we wanna draw a control volume, it might look like this. Okay. And so that we just, just by you know, intuition that if you're gonna spray a, a jet of water at something with wheels, then that thing is going to move. Okay. And so let's say that this, uh, this part right here is going to move with some velocity V0, okay? And this is gonna be different than the fluid velocity here, which is gonna be just U, okay? All right. Um, whenever I see this picture, I, I, if you guys watch Brooklyn Nine-Nine, I think of that scene with Terry Crews, where he's trying to build like a fairy princess castle for his, uh, his daughter. And for some reason, it comes with like these big, you know, Tonka truck wheels, you know, for whatever reason. So, you know, I think of the same thing too. It's like, why, why would you ever put wheels on something like this? Okay, and so we, uh, and so for these situations where we have a, we have a moving control volume, we need to modify the form of our Reynolds transport. Okay, and so our Reynolds transport theorem for this would look like this. Mostly, it's going to be the same. Okay, but there's going to be one key uh, modification. And so first we have our generation or our consumption term. Okay. Then we have our accumulation term. And so these two guys are actually gonna be the same. Okay, and so this is our, uh, um, oh, I forgot dot product n. Okay, and so this is our modified Reynolds transport theorem for moving control volume, okay? And you'll see that it's mostly the same. And so the only thing that changed was uh, this term right here, okay? So normally what we have is just the velocity of the fluid dot product with the normal vector, but for a case of a moving control volume, we have to subtract um, the velocity of the control volume. So we have, instead of just velocity of the fluid dot product with n, we have velocity of the fluid minus the velocity of the control volume dot product with n. Okay? Um, and so mathematically, you know, it's not that big of a, uh, um, it's not that big of a change. I think the most difficult thing with the moving control volumes is, uh, you know, keeping track of the different perspectives. Okay? Um, and so, um, you know, one perspective that you can say is that this, uh, this difference right here, this is the relative velocity um, of the fluid um, from the perspective of an observer that sits on the control volume. Okay. And so if you're sitting on this, if, if you're sitting on this control volume that's moving, you know, this is the velocity of the fluid that you, um, that you observe, right? Um, and so it's kind of the same things where like if you're sitting in your car and you see someone throw a baseball, right? And so the velocity that, of the baseball that you observe from the car is going to be different from the velocity that someone observes if they're sitting on the side, right? Because you're moving either along with the baseball or you're moving away from the baseball. Hopefully the velocity is not coming, hopefully the baseball is not coming towards your windshield because that would be scary, okay? Um, okay. Um, and so that's all we got time for today. And so remember, you know, this, uh, this, all these lessons right here, this is all just kind of set up for, you know, what we're going to do for the next couple of weeks. So starting on Monday, we're going to apply this to conservation of mass. Next Monday, we'll do conservation momentum, and we'll see how these are applied with RTT. Okay. 
Um, but before that, you know, we have our midterm on Wednesday. So, you know, of course, you know, I'll, I'll be here in the Zoom, in the Zoom room if you guys have questions. Um, but, you know, if, if you, uh, you know, you don't have to come in, you know, it's, uh, you're free to kind of do it on your own. Um, and remember, you know, for the exam, you know, the way that you can contact me for questions is uh, you can either send me an email um, or you can come into the Zoom room. Um, or if you're on the Discord server, you can private message me on Discord as well, and I'll, and I'll be able to answer you there. Okay. Uh, and so, you know, just because, you know, I know not everyone's going to come into the lecture on Wednesday, you know, I want to say, you know, best of luck for the exam to everyone. You know, I'm, I've am i written the exam already, so I think, you know, you guys are going to do pretty well. Um, so it's, uh, you know, and of course, you know, any questions that you have on the exam, um, I'm here to, to help. Okay. Um, so thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, have a great day. And I'll, if I don't see you on Wednesday, I'll see you on Monday. All right, so the question uh, in the chat is for the midterm, do I want to use 9.81 or 9.8 for the gravity? Um, it's, uh, again, you know, the numbers don't matter too much. So I'd say just use the one that's more convenient, which is 9.8. Uh, but as long as you show me in your work that says, you know, you have 9 point, you're using 9.8 or 9.81, you know, it, it, it doesn't matter. Too much. Mm -hmm. Is there going to be a, um, any... Uh, I want to say like theoretical stuff or, or uh, non quantitative things that we're going to be doing, like any kind of like definitions and, and other things like that. Yeah. So there's, yeah, there's going to be a, there's going to be four short answer questions. So I'm um, basically very similar to, uh, to the kind of the first problem that you see in all the homework. So I'm going to ask you some conceptual questions um, on that. So, um, you know, if you uh, if you um, just if you looked at the study guide, kind of the first section of the study guide is the conceptual learning objectives. So if you if you can answer all those things on the on the study guide, you're going to be in, in really good shape for the exam. So, you know, they're they're not going to be those questions exactly, but if you if you kind of answer those questions and you kind of really understand the concepts, you should have no problem with that that section on the exam. Cool. Mm -hmm. So we can show up and take the exam with you in Zoom on Wednesday, or we can just pop in and ask a question or yeah. whatever. Yeah. So, you know, because, you know, because we have this time reserved and for, for everyone's free, so I'll, I'll be in this Zoom room so you can come in and ask questions, but it, it's it's not required at all. So as long as you submit the exam before Thursday, 830, then that's, then that's fine. Cool. Thanks, Professor. Yep. All right. See you Wednesday then. Thank you. All right. Yep. See you guys. Thanks, guys. Ryan, did you uh, have any more questions? Okay, uh, I'm going to end the Zoom call then. Uh, but if you have any questions about anything, uh, you know, definitely uh, let me know.